Cap Times Idea Fest 2020 is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors. Presenting sponsor, the Burrish Group at UBS, a financial services firm with global access and a local focus to pursue what matters most for its clients. Major sponsors are HealthX Ventures, backing entrepreneurs who are creating value with digital health solutions. Exact Sciences, pursuing earlier detections and life-changing answers in the fight against cancer. Quartz, health plans built with you in mind. And Madison Gas and Electric, your community energy company whose goal is net zero carbon electricity by 2050. Co-sponsors are Epic Systems and the Godfrey Kahn Law Firm. Other sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Home Savings Bank, Unity Point Health Meritor, Cargo Coffee, and the Forward Theater Company. Media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal and Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Please consider becoming a Cap Times member. Learn more at membership.captimes.com. Hello, I'm Paul Fanland, editor and publisher of the Capital Times, and I'd like to welcome you to this session of Cap Times Idea Fest. This is our fourth annual event, but the first we are presenting virtually. Our theme this year is 2020 Changes Everything. Given the local and regional impact of COVID-19, the resulting economic damage, and the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement, this, there's a lot to talk about. We think this year's lineup is our best yet. We believe IdeaFest has grown into a signature event on the Madison calendar. It is also an important showcase for the Capital Times, our locally owned and century old journalism brand. If you're not already, we hope you'll consider becoming a Cap Times member. As a member, you'll have access to special IdeaFest programs plus benefits throughout the year. You'll also be supporting an independent and trustworthy local media source at a time when that has never been more important. Learn more at membership.captimes.com. I'd like to thank the Burrish Group at UBS, which is the presenting sponsor of IdeaFest and has been with us since the start. Andy Burrish and Jason Moss have built their asset management firm's stellar reputation by effective investing for Madisonians, but also for investing in Madison. Their generous support of IdeaFest is but one example of their community commitment. The session you're about to see has the Washington Post authors of the book, A Very Stable Genius, interviewed by David Marinus, and is sponsored by the Godfrey and Kahn Law Firm. We are deeply grateful to them for doing so, along with our other sponsors. So please, enjoy this session of IdeaFest, and thank you. Hello, Wisconsin. As the late, great William T. Avenue, founder and publisher of the Capital Times, my dad's old newspaper used to say. This is David Marinus, virtually, uh, coming to you from my office in Washington, D.C. I'm usually in Madison in the summer and fall. I'm enjoying it greatly, but nothing as usual this year. I'm delighted to be in conversation today with two amazing colleagues from the Washington Post, Carol Lennig and Phil Rucker. Phil, the uh, brilliant bureau chief for the Washington Post, Pulitzer Prize winner, and many of you who watched the Cap Times Idea Fest last year will be familiar with Carol, who was on a panel with the hilarious Alexandra Petri and super smart Catherine Rampell, an unforgettable trio for last year. Carol is a world-class investigative reporter and also a Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, and this year, they teamed up, Phil and Carol, a dynamic duo, to write the uh, incredible best-selling book, a very stable genius. I think that A might be the one true word in that uh, title. Um, you all know about it. We'll talk about that book and everything else that's going on in Washington. Um, unfortunately, not too much is going on. But anyway, first of all, welcome to both of you. Thanks for having us, David. Yeah, thank well, you, David. It's oh, a treat sure. to be here. You know, I've come to think of you reporters out there grinding away day after day, um, almost as war reporters now. And uh, because of the unending nature of this story and the conscience, con conscious tension and uh, adrenaline that must run through you, uh, I sometimes worry about whether when this is all over, you'll suffer from PTSD, but um, you're doing a fabulous job. And part of the 
the deal here is that, you know, every time you think that you've hit the bottom floor, there comes another trap door um, the next day, one trap door after another to another story. So even as I was preparing for this uh, program, a couple of more trap doors opened up. Um, the latest one yesterday with President Trump uh, raising questions about how we would handle the transfer of power, the very basis of our democracy. So I thought we'd start there and, and go different directions for each of you. Phil was sort of like what in his past you saw from that statement and whether how seriously we should take it. And Carol, how you see the institutions um, from the Justice Department, unfortunately, to um, the military and every other institution, how they will react to this, um, which everybody's nervous about coming in November. Yeah, David. Well, you know, this uh, this moment where the president is trying to undermine confidence in the election and lay the groundwork to claim that the vote tally is somehow rigged is almost Groundhog Day. It's a repeat of the strategy he employed in the fall of 2016 when he warned uh, that that election could be rigged and that, uh, you know, Hillary could try to steal the election through some sort of fraudulent voting uh, he, of course, ended up winning the Electoral College, but he lost a popular vote to Hillary Clinton by three million uh, and continued to claim for months after that uh, that he was the true winner of the popular vote because he cited uh, voter fraud. Of course, there's no evidence that any of that exists. Fast forward to today, and it's the exact same tactic, but sort of on steroids and in overdrive. The president is trying to sow doubt about the legitimacy of our elections. He's trying to warn that mail-in balloting, uh, which is legal in many states, which uh, there is no evidence of widespread fraud with mail-in balloting, but that that is somehow ripe uh, for corruption. And that the only way that he could possibly lose this election is if it's not a fair and free election. Uh, that, of course, is not true. There, there's a very real way for Joe Biden to win this election in the free and fair election, and that's simply with more people coming out and voting for him. Uh, that's how our democracy works. So to hear that statement from the president yesterday about the peaceful transfer of power, there are some Democrats who sort of laugh about it or think it's not serious or think mm -hmm. it's just Trump being Trump. But we've learned through four years of this presidency to take this president at his word. And when he makes statements like that, uh, they are deliberate uh, and they speak to a true intent that he has uh, as president. And, you know, the, the his political opponents here, but also the Congress, the courts, uh, all of the institutions in our government should take what he said very seriously and, and prepare as best they can uh, for the ways in which he may try to undo uh, the results of the election should he lose. Take him literally and seriously to contradict Correct. a yeah. famous uh, incorrect uh, statement about him. Carol, how do you think? I mean, let's say the worst happens and he doesn't go along with the, the transfer of power in any clear way. How do you think the institutions of America are, are ready to hold up to that? There's no absolute answer to that question, David, and that makes a lot of people quite concerned because on the one hand, there are defense, military, and national security officials who have sworn an oath to the Constitution and who actually have a duty to make sure there is a peaceful transfer of power. And they are eyeing this somewhat secretly with great um, preparations for what they should do in case the president tries in some way to resist leaving office should he not be reelected. And as Phil has described, you know, the president has a, uh, a plan A and a plan B, uh, as he's articulated it, for him to continue in power. Yesterday, he didn't say that he was willing to support a peaceful transition of power. He said there wouldn't be a need for a transfer, but there, there would just be a continuation. You know, but one thing you mentioned about institutions that's so frightening is that many institutions we would have expected to rebuff President Trump's influence, inter intervention, and, and honestly, corruption of the normal pattern of these independent institutions, they've not held up well in the past three and a half years to very specific threats. Uh, you mentioned the Department of Justice. That entity has a slew of line prosecutors 
who question themselves every day. Should this be the day I resign in protest about the improper political influence that's being exerted from the top on decisions that should be separate and, and sacrosanct and, and inviolate, kept separate from politics? In the military, you would have thought that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense would have kept their um, sort of independence as well when the president decided he wanted a photo op to show the public how strong he was on May 29th, I believe it was, in Lafayette Square. Forgive me, it might have been June 1. But when he decided he wanted a photo op to show his strength and he was going to forcibly clear uh, peaceful protesters exercising their constitutional right to free speech, he would use the, the visage of the military and rubber bullets and tear gas to remove them. How in the world was it that the Secretary of Defense and the Joint Chief were both present and by the president's side? That, that, that makes a lot of people very concerned underneath both of those individuals about whether or not these institutions have the strength to resist um, this kind of interference. You think that those two... Uh figures learned a lesson from that or? It's interesting because I do believe that Millie, um, this is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs yes. staff, I believe Millie was, was heartfelt in his mm -hmm. apology that came just days after um, former Secretary of Defense General Mattis criticized the use of the military's uh, brass and show of force in that episode. He said, uh, as I remember correctly, that it was a tragedy. And, and just a terrible abuse of military power. And to have the secretary and the joint chiefs there only made people very anxious about the military being abused and corrupted for President Trump's political purposes. You know, the, the trap door right before the transfer of power trap door um, was the Supreme Court. And when that happened, um, I really, one of the first things I thought about was the last line in your book. You know, um, is this what it was all about? Was this the transaction that it was all about? And in your book, you know, you sort of presage what's going to happen there, uh, even though you don't write about that. But in terms of how, what's the limit of tolerating Trump? And your words is they had to make quiet calculations about when, if ever, they might take a stand. You think it's now yeah. never? <laughs> well, David, they haven't taken a stand yet. Uh, and this, you know, if you you look at Mitch McConnell to just isolate one of the Republican senators, the leader, of course, from Kentucky, one of the things he cares about first and foremost is judicial appointments. And with this Trump presidency, uh, he's had a bounty of judicial appointments. It's been uh, a dream for McConnell. He's changed the he and, and Trump and and you know, together, the Republican Senate, they've changed the makeup of the federal courts uh, for years, for decades to come with all of these conservative jurists they've put on the bench. And this opportunity with the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, is, is sort of the crown jewel here, the chance to really uh, cement the rightward uh, redirection of the Supreme Court, replacing the liberal uh, icon with uh, what our reporting suggests is likely to be Amy Coney Barrett, who's a, a pretty hardline social conservative, very loyal, uh, you know, former uh, clerk for Antonin Scalia, who who is a judge very much in his mold. And so this is an opportunity for these Republicans. It's the reason why they didn't stand up to Trump for so many times. It's the reason why they voted uh, to acquit him in the impeachment trial. And it's mm -hmm. the reason why they're sort of uh, holding their noses right now because they want to get these these judges on the bench they also want to have uh, to maintain their power and to enact a number of other uh, conservative agenda items right after the election for example the court's going to be considering uh, the affordable care act uh, president obama's landmark health care law republicans for years uh, since immediately after it was passed in 2010 have tried to get rid of the affordable care act and now they have an opportunity where through the court uh, they could effectively nullify uh, Obamacare as we know it. And so this is just uh, a, st a strategy and a calculation by the Republican senators to enact their agenda, even if the cost is uh, the Trump presidency. 
Carol, in the book, you write about sort of the two types of people who work uh, in the administration, um, those who think Trump is out to save the world and those who think they're trying to save the world from Trump. Um, when you were reporting the book, which side did you find dominant in there? I mean, it's incredible how many sources you, you had who appeared to be on that second side. I actually think you've answered that question well already. I mean, just by reading it, you can tell that there were a very large number of people who joined this administration very much supportive, if, if not of President Trump's ideology, because they weren't sure that he actually had one, supportive of a conservative ideology and a belief that some of the things the president was touting were things they also wanted to see accomplished. But over time, they grew distraught. And ultimately, some of them really repulsed by what they saw in the Oval Office, why, by the actions of the president, the impulsivity, the lack of interest in history or learning anything about how some of his decisions would have long-term ramifications, and very concerned about this seesaw in which his personal interests were always the weightiest and the national interest was always not just secondary, but hardly noticed. That, that group that felt they were ultimately trying to save the world from Donald Trump was the overwhelming group that, that we came across. I will say, as an addition, that Phil and I have found that in those first three years that we chronicled in the book, things have changed. Uh, increasingly, you know, we said the guardrails are gone. The people who believed they were saving things by keeping them orderly, by keeping the president fenced in a little bit and trying to give him good guidance, to sometimes a lecture or two. Those folks are basically gone. And now they're replaced by, uh, in large measure, people who are yes men, yes women, sycophants, enablers, and some people who are just too weak to say, this is a bad idea. I think that is one of the most concerning things that I hear out of this administration now filtering out our aides and, and deputies who say there's nobody telling him no anymore. And you have only those very few people like Olivia Troy and the Homeland Security guy before that who have shown the courage to come out and put their names on it and speak up um, without naming names when you two were dealing with all of these sources, did you find them sort of ruminating about what they should do and whether they should do what Olivia Troy eventually did? Phil? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, David. We found that they were not, many of these people were not even considering what Olivia Troy did. And for a couple of reasons, uh, some of them felt honor bound not to criticize a sitting president while he's still in office. This is the rationale, uh, for example, that uh, General Jim Mattis has uh, told confidence and associates he believes in. Of course, uh, a few months ago, he did come out and criticize Trump, and it was a big deal when he did so, because until then, he had so many deep misgivings with the direction of this presidency, but felt it was sort of a code of honor uh, not to speak out against him not to politicize uh, those feelings while he's still in office. And a number of others felt that way too. There's also a, a, a real kind of fear of retaliation, uh, as heroic as it may be for somebody like Olivia Troy or Miles Taylor, the Homeland Security official, to speak truth to power and, and tell their story and tell the public how alarmed they have been by this president. Uh, these folks have mortgages to pay, they have children to raise, they have careers in the future to think about, and it can be very difficult for them to operate in this environment as a former Trump official uh, if they're blacklisted effectively by the president and by all of his uh, enforcers. And, you know, it, it, it's not unlike a mob scenario where you just have a lot of people around Trump who are loyal to the president who will do anything to destroy uh, people who are seen as disloyal or speaking out. And, and so there's a real fear uh, within the administration from people. But, you know, these days there are very few of those people left in the government. Most of the people who are around the president day to day in the Oval Office helping guide him through 
decisions about the pandemic, through decisions about race relations, and and through his reelection campaign strategy, are are complete enablers, uh, sycophants, people who are trying to please the president and do whatever he wants done. You know, I noticed today a, a, a quote from a Republican pollster, and when the reporter said he answered anonymously. Um, uh, the reason was he didn't want to worry about starting his car every morning, you know, which is probably yeah. the greatest explanation for an anonymous quote <laughs> I've ever seen. Exactly. Um, right. Hyperbolic, but nonetheless, uh, incredible. Uh, I want to go to a larger picture about writing a book. Um, what did you see as the mission of this book when you started it? What did you see as the parameters and what your goals were for it? It felt, you, it, it, it felt like when we started, what, what our basic goal was, was history. You know, we knew that history was unfolding right in front of our eyes, and it was moving so fast that we had to take a, a, a break, uh, hit the pause button, and figure out how to tell this story that was so consequential, like no presidency either of us had ever witnessed or covered. And both of us together, you know what, have... 55 years of experience covering, covering presidents, it's, it's sort of gobsmacking how different this one was. So that was the simple goal. Start reporting out what was historic and different and unusual. Go behind the scenes and see what could we learn that we hadn't learned while on the treadmill of covering the daily events that were so striking and, and norm busting. But as we went along, Phil and I filling our notebooks, we learned that we were, we were getting an inside view on the president's psychology. And I don't mean his mental health, but really what made him tick? Who was he? Everyone can sort of feel that they know the president just by watching his broadcasts or his press conferences live or his various um, ad hoc uh, conversations with reporters on the South Lawn on his way to the helicopter. But what was really going on with his, his mental decision making and his motivations? And that became our driving force and our, and our frame for how to write about it. And, and many thanks to our editor, Ann Godoff at Penguin Press, who in consultation sort of helped us get to that, that decision about how to write this book. And Phil, where did that take you in terms of getting inside Donald Trump's motivations and mind? Well, the, the key in, in sort of better understanding Trump is, is to better understand the granular detail of what happened behind the scenes and how decisions are made. And it's a type of reporting sort of pioneered in many respects by our colleague Bob Woodward, uh, you know, the, the final days, his book uh, at the end of the Nixon presidency, sort of reconstructing with meticulous care, uh, with dialogue, with notes, with uh, vivid accounts from firsthand witnesses, what exactly happened. And you end up going from sort of a, a, a broad sense in real time of what had happened in that, in that decision or that event, and you start to peel back the layers and you learn so much more, and there, there's more nuance that you didn't understand at the time, or a different meaning, or you learn something really horrifying that the president said. For example, uh, the president, what, one of the vivid scenes, I think, in our book, A Very Stable Genius, is when the president went to the Pentagon uh, in July of 2017 for a briefing uh, with the generals with and, and some of his other top advisors. And this is an event that was on his public calendar. Everybody knew in real time that he had gone to the tank. Uh, that meeting room at the Pentagon for this meeting. It had been reported in sort of a broad sense in a number of other places over the years. But when Carol and I went back and really talked to people in the room to, to recount exactly what was said, what was that dialogue, what was the back and forth, that's when we learned that the president called the generals a bunch of losers uh, and the war in Afghanistan a loser war. And he said, I wouldn't go to war with you people. And he called them dopes and babies. I mean, those are extraordinary comments from the president that give you new insight into his psychology, into what he thought about the military, into the way he treated others, into his lack of respect for those who serve our country in uniform uh, that we didn't have in real time, but through doing this additional reporting, you learn. Yeah, that was very valuable and came before Jeffrey Goldberg's uh, piece, which yeah. added on to that. Um, one of the other things I learned, it shouldn't have surprised me, uh, was that 
actually, if Trump, if Trump in private would have talked about being a very stable genius, he would have said a very stable effing genius. Uh, uh, you know, he, he was much more vulgar than I guess most politicians are in private. But I was also struck by the scenes of him at Bedminster, you know, um, when he wasn't golfing, what was he doing? He was in his room watching television for hours on end. Um, what else does he do, this hardest working president in history? You know, I'm glad you mentioned that, David, because we had always been sort of, as while we were reporting for the Daily Washington Post, um, as opposed to reporting for the book, we noticed over and over again this bizarre quality to the president's schedule, his public schedule, uh, which was that increasingly after the inauguration, it went from you know briefing at 9.30 to maybe a briefing at 10.30 to maybe a briefing every other day at 11.30 or noon. That was because the president increasingly cre you know, created more and more executive time for him to call friends and watch television. Um, he sat in his room in, uh, in the residence, basically absorbing and, and hate watching some of the television programs and broadcasts he claims are fake news. But, but honestly, which he wants the approval of, and he follows their coverage in incredible detail, CNN, MSNBC, uh, all the major networks, he is tracking what they're saying about him He's looking at what the New York Times, his hometown newspaper, and the Washington Post are saying, not, not reading those papers, but uh, watching television coverage of the news stories as mm -hmm. they're captured on cable news. And it is a striking thing that the White House staff had to spend so much of their time sort of ginning up and manipulating uh, an impression that the president was working. Because honestly, in his first several years, and continuing until this day, he was often spending every weekend going to one of his golf resorts to golf. It was his release, his relief, but it is a lot of hours to play 18 holes and have lunch with your friends at the clubhouse. And so the staff would have to gin up events, say a conference call with a world leader from Bedminster or a quickie meeting that a series of cabinet members would be summoned to for lunch at his club in Virginia. Just again, to give the impression that this was a quote unquote working weekend, when really a lot of it is him conferring with his friends on the phone, golfing and watching television. So who would he call the most? Sean Hannity. Is that right? Anyone else? I mean, like if he on his speed dial, who's who else is there? You know, there were quite a few of his old friends. Originally, um, he would have been calling Tom Barrack in the early days. They had a bit of a falling out. Um, Sean Hannity was was absolutely more on his call list than his own children, according to his aides. There were uh, Chris Christie was somebody he really enjoyed talking to, though he wasn't as frequent later on on the call list. Um, lots of Fox News friends. Uh, Phil, if you have others you want to add, go for it. Yeah, I mean, he would call Lou Dobbs regularly. All, all the Fox personalities that he uh -huh. tweets about and talks about, he'd watch their show and then call them to comment about it. Uh, Lou, Judge Janine, on and on and on. It's a feedback loop. You know, Bill Clinton's first law of politics was to make it not about him, but about the people. And it seems like Trump has somehow been able to turn that on end. Um, one of the larger themes in your book is that this presidency is all about him. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. Uh, you know, there's there's an incredible narcissism here and i don't say that as a as a clinical diagnosis but just the simple fact that this is a president consumed uh by his own ego uh driven uh, to improve his image focused on his own popularity his, how he looks um i know we're here to talk about a very stable genius but i just read uh bob woodward's rage and there's an incredible moment where uh, he he's trying to interview the president about diplomatic relations with North Korea, and Trump is fixated on 
uh, 11 by 17 photo printouts of him and Kim Jong-un and look at these great photos and can you believe I'm the only one that Kim will smile with and don't we look amazing in this picture? I mean, he's just so focused on image and on how he looks uh, to an incredible degree. And that came through in all of uh, Carol and my reporting uh, for our book where you know he would he would lash out at AIDS when he thought he wasn't getting the star treatment that he deserved and was just really focused on media coverage, not because he wanted to stay abreast necessarily of, of what uh, people out in the country are talking about, but because he was driven to, to see every mention of himself. He would like to sort of fast forward through his DVR recordings of different cable news shows to try to see how people were talking about him mm -hmm. or what B-roll images they would play of him, just very focused on himself. You know, I think your book and Bob's complement one another very well, actually. They're not, they don't seem in competition, but just adding to each other. Um, one of the remarkable things about Trump, though, is though even though it's all about him from the inside out, he has this following that thinks that he's made it all about them, um, despite comments like from Olivia Troy of that scene where um, he talks about how he's glad he doesn't have to shake hands anymore because of those disgusting people. Um, yeah. And he, in your reporting, did you come across other um, incidents that sort of uh, amplify what she said about that in terms of the way he views even his own adoring public? You know, David, that's a good question. I, I feel like we have a couple of moments like that in some of our reporting, but some of the most striking ones are already pretty well known. I mean, one of them is, you know, Michael Cohen's testimony. Michael Cohen, who used to be his sort of uh, mafioso lawyer uh, fixer, um, who said that the president remarked that, um, you know, people who voted for him were idiots and he couldn't believe how stupid they were that they were falling for his show. It was all about the show and it was successful. Um, you have, in fact, a previous reporting before the president was elected in which he made a remark that if he ever ran for president, he'd run as a Republican because it was really easy yes. to snow Republican voters. They were really easy to manipulate based on certain issues. And, um, you know, in behind the scenes in our reporting, what we learned is that he was constantly talking about making sure his base was fed, fed little little dribbles and, and, and tidbits that would make them feel supported. But ultimately, part of the reason, and you know, you can't diagnose an entire group of voters who buy snake oil um, and accept it as medicine, but there is a large group of, of people who are supportive of Donald Trump simply because he is talking in, an, in a politically incorrect and kind of coarse way that they value, that they consider um, their language. And they're sick and tired of kowtowing to what they view as a politically correct elite. They're tired of not being able to speak their minds about minorities and immigrants and how they view them um, with some concern. and. Um, more than concern with some derision. So Trump speaks their language, and that is something we heard often and often, that often again, that uh, pr the president would tell his aides, look, I'm, I'm just an every man, and, and part of the reason these people love me is because I, I speak their language. Sure. We're gonna take a short break. Um, we're talking with Carol Lennig and Phil Rucker, and we'll be back to talk about COVID, which happened after their book, but their book really prepares us for. Cap Times Idea Fest 2020 is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors. Presenting sponsor, the Burrish Group at UBS, a financial services firm with global access and a local focus to pursue what matters most for its clients. Major sponsors are HealthX Ventures, backing entrepreneurs who are creating value with digital health solutions. Exact Sciences, pursuing earlier detections and life-changing answers in the fight against cancer. Quartz, health plans built with you in mind. And Madison Gas and Electric, your community energy company whose goal is net zero carbon electricity by 2050. Co-sponsors are Epic Systems and the Godfrey Kahn Law Firm. Other sponsors 
our Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Home Savings Bank, Unity Point Health Meritor, Cargo Coffee, and the Forward Theater Company. Media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal and Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Please consider becoming a Cap Times member. Learn more at membership.captimes.com. We're back with Carol Lennig and Phil Rucker. Um, you know, your book came out before the pandemic, before COVID-19. But has anything about the way President Trump has handled this seemed out of character with the president that you reported about? Carol? I'm happy to answer that. Um, I feel as though all of our reporting led me to feel completely unsurprised by how the president has handled COVID. When, it, when he was first warned of this in January, when the words COVID were first sort of coming out of China and being published in stories in the United States, the president was immediately downplaying it because he was concerned how it might affect the stock market and his own standing as a incredibly successful president as far as the economy went. He was focused not on would it, would the Wuhan uh, pneumonia that was so mysterious at the time cause epicenters of transmission in California, in Georgia, in New York, some of the first places that it started to arrive. He wasn't concerned about how that might spread continue through the country and eventually become within a week or two's time uncontrollable, untraceable. He was uh, listening to the advice of Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, who said, let's not spook the market. Uh, this to me and to Phil sounded so resonant of our own experience in this reporting for the book, where the president always put his personal political stakes far ahead of that of our national security, our national um, standing in the world, and the actual lives of Americans. Bill, how important did you see Jared Kushner in this White House? You know, Jared Kushner has always been an important figure in the White House. He was an important figure in the campaign. Uh, the president's son-in-law, in, in many ways, sort of, uh, you know, has a lot of Donald Trump's attributes, right? He, he doesn't particularly have morals or ethical grounding. He cares about winning. He cares about retaliating against enemies. He cares about making money. Those are some of the things that motivate him. But during COVID-19, he's become even more powerful than he was in the first three years of the presidency. He's effectively been leading uh, the government response to this pandemic. And a lot of the scientific and medical experts in our government and outside in the public health community uh, would tell you that he's doing a pretty horrendous job at it. Uh, he is in over his head. He doesn't have a full understanding of the science uh, behind COVID-19. He's focused primarily on public relations, how to have sort of uh, deliverables that would show the public that things are successful, even if they aren't necessarily. Uh, this is all according to our reporting. He was in charge of the distribution of ventilators of, of PPE, uh, which was a problem initially. Of course, uh, the US did catch up on ventilators pretty quickly, but PPE continues to be a problem for a lot of states, a lot of uh, hospitals and communities around the country. And he's also been responsible for the testing uh, challenges that the country has had. Uh, he was a big advocate of the Abbott, uh, you know, quick tests, but then didn't expand that program fast enough and, and has not uh, prioritized the national testing strategy, uh, which public health experts say is a, a tremendous detriment to America's ability uh, to limit the spread of this virus. Uh, so he's front and center. Uh, he will continue to be uh, we're continuing to learn more and report more about the specific role that he's played and, and some of the things that he has said and, and the decisions that he has made behind the scenes. But, you know, he is he is the, the number one uh, person behind Trump in terms of the U.S. pandemic response. Sounds like you're working on another story about that. Well, um, we're, it's it's an it's always an ongoing it's story, always, right, yes, David? Of course, it never <laughs> stops. Um, 
So then you come to the real cipher in this administration, uh, Mike Pence. Where where did your reporting take you on him? Why is he doing this, and what what is he doing? I mean, he he allegedly was running the uh, the uh, COVID response, right? Yes, but the vice president wasn't um, generating enough good ratings for the president, and so he kind of uh, kicked him to the sidelines because ratings are paramount. You know. I, I'm so glad you asked this because in our early reporting about Mike Pence, one conversation that Phil and I had with a source really stuck out for me about him. And that was in that moment in the tank back in 2017 when, you know, a man whose son has gone to war um, is hearing the president deride and diminish the value of that contribution, the value of the military soldiers who go to war, calling them losers, dopes, babies, saying that they don't know how to win, that he wouldn't go to war with these people. He is sitting there, as described by one of our sources, like a silent wax figure. And to me, that has carried through from that moment until today. Mike Pence always makes a point, and this is true in every presidency, um, uh, surrogates and, and lieutenants will often say, as the president said, but Mike Pence will go out of his way to ignore what is right in front of us factually to say the president is doing a great job, the president is leading us in an amazing way, and to essentially say sentences that deny what the president has just done. I think, you know, we don't know the full answer to the question of what makes Mike Pence tick. But what we can see in front of our faces is a person who has learned that you stick around by, by singing Donald Trump's praises. You stick around by nodding approvingly. And that is pretty much all he has done as vice president. And that's all he wants to do is stick around? Well, there may have been a moment when he wondered if the right. president would be impeached and whether he would be then naturally in line to become the president. And being silent and standing off to the side politely or, or, or lightly clapping would be totally uh, fitting for then getting into the number one slot. But that didn't happen. In fact, the president was able to surf right over um, evidence of crime that was far more serious than what uh, was found involving President Nixon. The president was not impeached in the early part of 2020 when that vote was taken, and uh, forgive me, he was impeached, he was acquitted um, in by the Senate, and whatever dreams Vice President Pence may have had, he's returned to that wax figure stature. And Phil, you know, there was some of that superficial speculation for a while that, Pence, that Trump would dump Pence for Nikki Haley or something like that. Um, I never bought it. I, I'm curious whether knowing Trump from the inside, you also saw that as something that wasn't going to happen. You know, it, it certainly was um, speculation and there was reason for the speculation because uh, according to our reporting, the president was privately talking with people about possibly replacing Mike Pence. So it wasn't just a parlor game, it, it was real in the sense that the president was entertaining this. But, you know, we know Donald Trump entertains these sorts of things all the time. He's always asking, how is so-and-so doing as chief of staff? Should I keep so-and-so as the defense secretary? He likes to play these sort of casting call uh, games with his buddies and with his political allies. And I never really read much more into it. I, I always assumed he wouldn't replace Pence, even if he saw political gain in having uh, a woman, for example, on the ticket like Nikki Haley, uh, the former U.N. ambassador and South Carolina governor, simply because replacing your vice president would be such an extraordinary ad admission of failure. It would be uh, a symbol to the country that, you know, you didn't get it right the first time, that things are not going well, that you're doomed to lose. And that's why you have to kick Pence off the ticket. So I just didn't think Trump would actually pull the trigger and do that. Although it certainly is true that he entertained it and thought about it. And by the way, to your earlier question about Jared Kushner, our understanding uh, is that Kushner and Ivanka Trump have been among those 
uh, who were, you know, encouraging or at least entertaining the possibility of dumping Pence. They have had friction uh, over the years with Pence as well as with some of the vice president's uh, top advisors and, and have, have long admired Nikki Haley and had a good relationship with Nikki Haley. So there was a feeling that, uh, a widespread feeling within Trump's orbit that Nikki Haley was the preferred uh, number two for, for Jared and Ivanka, but it was not to be. My take was slightly different about why I didn't think it would happen, but it's based on a lot of what you reported in your book, which is that the reason you would dump Pence is to get somebody who was stronger or had more oomph, but Trump wouldn't want that. He wouldn't want anybody ever to even threaten to overshadow him yeah. in any way. That's what your book is all about in many ways, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And he also loves that Pence is just so... Uh, disciplined in praising him and and never crossing him and and he's he's like a puppy dog in that sense and I think uh, I think Trump really admires that and likes that in his vice president. Carol, um, you know, several books have come out in the last few weeks um, by Andrew Weissman and Jeffrey Tubin on Robert Mueller's failings to a certain extent, um, and your reporting early on sort of had him as. I, I think there's a quote in your book about it, him as a Wizard of Oz figure in a way. Um, so tell me about, sir, what, what you found about Mueller and Trump and that whole. Yes. Well, as Phil and I reported, you know, there was a lot of um, discon, uh, how do I say it? A lot of disturbance behind the scenes inside the Mueller team. There were members of that team, as we reported in the book, who had some concern about the kind of, um, you know, Weissman, Andrew Weissman, a member of that team, now calls it the mealy-mouthed conclusion of the Mueller report. And what, team, what people told us at the time was that the team was just disturbed, that they, as prosecutors, they had so much evidence that the president had committed crime, enough evidence that would normally lead to, to an indictment, to charges. And if this person had not been the sitting president, they would have been indicted um, soon after, you know, giving, given a chance to plead guilty. And they were upset that Mueller wasn't saying that out loud. Mm -hmm. Another part of our reporting, um, which is fleshed out very well by Weissman in his new book, was that uh, the way Barr, the attorney general, took advantage of Robert Mueller, and Robert Mueller allowed himself to be taken advantage of. Uh, when, when Mueller had finished his report, he telegraphed to Barr's office that he was ready to, to release it, and he wanted to share the basic findings. And in a, a critical meeting in March of 2019, he is explaining with his aides that they're not going to reach a conclusion about whether or not the president was guilty of a crime or engaged in criminal activity. Barr is stunned by this. The team is also on the attorney general side stunned that, that Mueller does not look like the strong FBI director that they have all known. Mm -hmm. Remember that Mueller and Barr had been social friends. They'd gone to each other's children's weddings. They knew each other quite well from from the Bush years, and Barr left the room and said, did you guys notice anything weird about him? He thought his hand was shaking. He thought he wasn't really finding his words very well, but he'd lost a step. And in the intervening weeks, when, when Mueller turns over the report, Barr decides to tell the entire public, here are the big takeaways, and the big takeaways are that there's no evidence of obstruction by the president, and there's been no collusion. Well, that was was really inaccurate and 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 disingenuous and a a bastardization of what those prosecutors found, and they were fuming and angry. Uh, they wanted Mueller to correct the record to consider a press conference, uh, but he and his top deputy Aaron Zebley decided they wouldn't do that. Uh, they'd be polite. Uh, deputies of the Justice Department and allow the attorney general to do what he wanted to do. I never thought about it that way, but when you described Barr seeing Mueller's hands shaking, was that to Barr a sign that he could overtake him, that he was weaker than Barr thought, and that he could bully him? Or 
I don't want to, I don't think I want to get into the attorney general's mind frame, but it was certainly a fact he had at his disposal when he decided to, to exploit this opportunity. You know, the opportunity was that he knew Mueller was a by the book prosecutor. He wasn't going to hold a news conference in the attorney general's mind. So the attorney general was going to have the first and only word for almost a month's time about what the Mueller report had found, what the investigators had found. And if you remember back to that time, Dave, you know, as Phil and I were reporting it in real time, uh, everybody was with bated breath waiting for Mueller to, to provide his findings. But Barr got to summarize what happened. It wasn't, ina- it wasn't accurate, it wasn't fair, and Mueller didn't put up a fight. Phil, from the very beginning, you've dealt with four press secretaries in this administration. Um, you know, unlike almost any, I've never put too much stock in press secretaries anyway. I've always tried to work around them. But, but to some extent, as a White House bureau chief, you have to. Um, what has that been like, one after another, um, from the very beginning, saying things that you know are lies. And, you know, how does the, how, how has it been for the, as a White House correspondent to deal with that, with these people? Well, you know, for each of them, uh, one of the first questions that they've been asked in their first briefings by reporters, not me, but, you know, other reporters in the room is, you know, will you promise to, to always tell the truth to the American people? Oh, or something that, like that. Yeah. Will will you not will you not lie from that podium? And right. of course, you know it's like clockwork. They they lie. Um, you know, to varying degrees. It, to to her credit, Sarah Sanders, you know, would try to sort of contort the truth in a way that achieved what the president wanted said without oh, yeah. sort of technically lying all the time. Although she did in some cases, but mm-hmm. others were much more blatant about. Uh, about their falsehoods and their lies, including and especially Kaylee McEnany, the current press secretary, who has has is really up there as a kind of almost campaign spokesperson for the president uh, yeah. to to say whatever he wants said. But the the truth is, and you got to this, David, uh, a good White House reporter relies on sources uh, other than the press secretary. That there's sort of a performance art and show quality to what the White House press secretary does at those briefings. And we as reporters uh, take part in it to some degree because we go there and we ask our questions on camera and we get lied to to our faces and we carry on with our business. But uh, all of my colleagues on the Washington Post White House team and I uh, spend a great deal of effort uh, trying to find and identify and cultivate sources uh, in the government and and around the government uh, who are going to be more truthful to us uh, even if they're doing so anonymously uh, than the on-camera spokespeople for the president are. And we rely on them for the information, and we, we end up breaking a lot of our, our news scoops that way uh, without even really dealing with the White House press secretary. Performance art is a good way to put it. Um, and Kaylee McEnany, who is the, the best at it in terms of lying, does she know she's lying? I, I assume she knows she's lying. I've never had this discussion with her, but she's a pretty smart uh, individual. She's a graduate of Harvard Law School. Right. She uh, stands up there at that rostrum very well prepared. She spends a number of hours every day going over the news of the day and figuring out exactly how she's going to answer the question. She has a pretty thick binder with all these tabs for uh, her talking points to flip to and quotes to to cite back. So she's on top of it. She knows what she's doing and she knows exactly what she's saying. Uh, And she knows when she's lying that she's doing so deliberately. And frankly, that's why I feel so comfortable using that word with her Mm -hmm. lying because she does so deliberately. It's not like she's, you know, mistakenly saying something that's false. Uh, She's prepared at that podium and she says exactly what she wants to say. For both of you, is this covering this administration challenged or changed the way you view your job and your um, ethics or the definition of what it means to be a journalist? Carol? I, for myself, I feel that on the one hand, there has been no president in my lifetime like this that has challenged the press in the way that he has. Um, calling us fake news, 
uh, attacking us personally by name on Twitter to his millions of follow followers, um, calling Phil and I, you know, lowlifes and all sorts of other interesting um, phrases. I, I find that really challenging. I will say that we are still doing our work the same way we've always done it, mm -hmm. the old school way. We gather the information, we vet it. There are so many things that we have heard from tipsters and from very good frontline sources that we that are very, very unflattering about President Trump and, and kind of um, scandalous that we've not published because they have not met our test and our bar. Mm -hmm. We are not going to change our threshold for accuracy um, just because the president uh, has made it a, a made us sort of an enemy and is campaigning against us. We are not campaigning against him. We are simply trying to deliver the truth all the time. I do find one thing very, very difficult though, uh, and I find it also humorous. There has never, it, it also reflects back to your early or question, David, about the press secretaries. Never in my lifetime, um, in my career, have I gone to a White House press secretary or a top White House aide and said, we're about to publish this information. I need your, you to engage um, and let me know if you think there's anything inaccurate or accurate about this and have that person lie to my face. And that has happened so many times in this administration. Real professionals who do this work um, know that you don't lie to a reporter when they have this kind of information. In the past, I would have halted myself and, and said, oh, well, they say it's not true. In fact, I did that during the early years of this presidency. Mm -hmm. Oh, the White House press secretary or the press aide said this isn't true, so it must not be true. They would not lie to me. Um, but in fact, I don't hold back anymore on that, on that threshold because I've been proven wrong over and over again. Nope. Oh. Yeah, you know, David, I think Carol um, put that really nicely. And I would just add that I think uh, these Trump years haven't changed how I think about journalism, but it is, they have crystallized for me uh, how what we do as journalists fits into this sort of experiment with democracy mm -hmm. in this country. And, you know, we always uh, hold up the First Amendment and we think about the role of journalists in society and, and sort of a uh, theoretical sense, but in the Trump years, it has really made clear to us, like how us finding out this information is so critical and can change the course of history and can change how people uh, view what's happening uh, in their own country and to their own country and in this society. And, and that's been really um, gratifying and also really uh, just raises the stakes for our profession and for what we're doing every day. Um, and I, I covered the Obama White House. I've covered politics for 10 years before Trump. And I never um, I, I never had this kind of clarifying sense of mission that I have now. That's great. As your editor, Marty Barrett, says, we're not at war, we're at work. And yeah, he are, says it very well. <laughs> he does, yes. Um, Carol, you've done some um, very important reporting on the response to the Black Lives Matter movement, and especially as you talked about that incident in front of the church. Um, where do you see this president in terms of sort of thinking that he can replay 1968 or the 1960s and, and play the race card so heavily? Well, first off, we know that the president um, has some has said a lot of very racist things and likes to bait people using race. Uh, there's a current of racism in our country. There's a chronic uh, racist quality to a lot of our police forces and, and, and to, to a lot of our institutions. And the president works that like a, a master. So, it, you know, we, we often say, people ask us, oh, is he really a very stable genius? And on the issue of of marketing himself and mastering his megaphone. He is genius in some respects because he is working people against each other in this country. And as General Mattis said, dividing us in a way that no other president has done before. He has um, tried to tell voters that 
Democrats are going to take away your suburbs, which is just code for we're going to put you with a lot more black people or have black people move into your neighborhoods, black people that are criminals, a sort of boogeyman quality. He has um, used such incredible force of the federal government to go after Black Lives Matters protesters, helped and enabled by his attorney general, Bill Barr, and used you know, weapons of war against people who are exercising their First Amendment rights. It's so striking because, you know, you see these white teenagers who say, we want to change how the police are funded. We want to change what's happening in our, in our countries and our, in our country and in our cities to honor the lives of black people the way we honor the lives of white people. People who are stopped for, uh, for speeding who are white don't get shot. People who are stopped for speeding who are black do more frequently than any of us can continue to, to countenance. And we have little white teenage girls going out and, and saying that this isn't fair, and they are treated in a way by our president as if they are um, waging war against the country, engaged in sedition. It's so scary to me to watch this unfold because as Phil and I have discussed ourselves, this is a president who is beyond being shamed, and you have to wonder what tools he will use in the ensuing months as we get closer to the election to try to continue to divide us and, and increase his odds, essentially, of holding power for another four years. What tools does he have left, Phil? <laughs> he has, you know, I, I feel like he doesn't really have any secret tools that we don't know about. He's pretty right. transparent about what his tools are, uh, but they're they're significant. And, you know, some of his critics like to laugh it off. But um, his tool of persuasion, his tool of, uh, of communication, just repeating something, even if it's not true again and again and again, until a lot of people just believe it is true. And that becomes the new reality for half of our country. Uh, those are serious tools and they're tools that not a lot of other people in politics have. And, uh, and he uses them to great effect and he could potentially use it to great effect in this uh, run up to November 3rd. I, I would add yeah. that there, 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 I would just add that the, some of the tools of Bill's totally right about the man and his power uh, as a communicator. But some of the tools of government that he's used, at least at Lafayette Square, are worrisome. Mm -hmm. Would he deputize the National Guard to come out and stop people protesting his rejection of ballots? Would he use the U.S. military? Would he use, um, you know, these bizarre infrared tools that he wanted, that not he, but that the military was considering using against Black Lives Matter protesters? Would he uh, suspend habeas corpus? If he's willing to, to charge people with sedition, would he use other emergency powers? Those are sort of questions in my mind because he's got a large arsenal in the US government. Um, we'll see. Yes, and he's got the just, his Justice Department, as he calls it. Uh, it really is his at this yeah. point. So it gets back to my initial question about you know, whether the other institutions will be strong enough to stand up against that. Um, the subtitle of your book is Donald J. Trump's Testing of America. Um, it's been an incredible test for you two as well. This is uh, an imprecise question, but did you come out of this more pessimistic or optimistic about our democracy? I'm going to kick that one to Phil and see what he has to say. You know, I, 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 why, I, it's a little bit hard to say exactly how I came out of the book process feeling, but I can tell you how I feel today, yes. which is um, reasonably pessimistic, frankly, uh, about our democracy. And it's because, you know, we, we always have this belief that the institutions are holding and that the norms are going to be protected and that there's only so far Donald Trump as president can go. And yet month after month of this presidency, he moves that marker forward. And just in the last week, it's moved a couple of steps forward. 
with both what he, he and McConnell are, are going to be doing in short order on the Supreme Court and with this talk from the president, very real talk, I think, uh, about not having a peaceful transfer of power, about litigating the results of the election and challenging it and, and having his, you know, Trump appointed Supreme Court make a ruling on who actually won uh, the election in November. That is not cause for for optimism for anybody who believes in sort of the virtues and values of American democracy. Uh, that said, I, you know, this is a, a country of a lot of good people and a lot of good people who know what's going on and who are, um, who are fighting, who are shining the light and including all of us uh, through our journalism. And, you know, I, I would not give up on, on that and, and there could be another chapter here, but, um, but there is cause to be pessimistic at this hour about, uh, about this president's sort of violation of a lot of the democratic norms in our country. I used to say that I thought the short term was iffy, but I was optimistic about the long term. I think I'm going to have to change iffy to something a little stronger these days, but <laughs> if we get through it. Um, yeah. Anyway, there's nothing iffy about you two, and I greatly appreciate both of you, what you're doing, taking the time today, and keep at it. Thank you, thank very you much. so much, David. Sure. Okay. David, can I, I want to say thank you too, and on behalf of Phil and me, also say thank you for supporting local journalism and your father's paper. Because if we don't have those kinds of institutions around the country, everyone's a loser. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Great. Absolutely. Yeah. Take care. Cap Times Idea Fest 2020 is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors presenting sponsor, The Burrish Group at UBS, a financial services firm with global access and a local focus to pursue what matters most for its clients. Major sponsors are HealthX Ventures, backing entrepreneurs who are creating value with digital health solutions. Exact Sciences, pursuing earlier detections and life-changing answers in the fight against cancer. Quartz, health plans built with you in mind. And Madison Gas and Electric, your community energy company whose goal is net zero carbon electricity by 2050. Co-sponsors are Epic Systems and the Godfrey Kahn Law Firm. Other sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Home Savings Bank, Unity Point Health Meritor, Cargo Coffee, and the Forward Theater Company. Media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal and Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Please consider becoming a CapTimes member. Learn more at membership.captimes.com.